Hey folks, this is Chris with Oregon Figs. It has been six days since I gave you my last update and we've had incredible weather. We've had a period here, an extended period from anywhere from 75 to uh, 94 degrees, which is completely unusual for the Pacific Northwest and the Willamette Valley in particular. So this is what's happened with the heat. Figs have gone from pretty darn, darn near nothing to this. Once again, this is why I advocate for a smaller footprint on your trees. And this is why I say don't use spreaders to make your limbs too wide because you won't be able to fit your trees together. The more you spread that footprint apart, the further apart you have to keep your trees. And in, in my case, I start in a little microclimate on my deck. And if I spread my trees too far apart, I can't get in and, and uh, take care of them. Yesterday was the first day that I actually put um, any moisture in these pots this year. And we've had a lot of hot, dry weather. You can see the typical shape of my trees. And this is an example of how I'm going to shape a tree. This is Vincenzo. And uh, you can see what's going to happen there. You see how that branch is shooting off that way? And how this one's shooting off? And how this one's shooting off? That's going to form a beautiful scaffold. I'm not going to need to take any stakes and spread and spread the limbs. I'm just going to let it grow naturally and I'll rub off the buds to keep the footprint under control so that I can have a tree like my nephiok here with this beautiful shape that uh, is under control that I can move or I can get around the tree. I think if you see the shape, overall shape of my trees, I mean, this is uh, all done without any kind of staking other than the initial staking. Uh, when I first start the tree, here's kind of an interesting shape of a tree. This is De La Roca. And my method there, that's from Harvey back in 2019. I bought a cutting from him. This is kind of like a candelabra. You can see that's kind of a wonderful shape. Let's get in and peek at Joal Noir. Single stem, nice and open. All of these just grew naturally this way after I started it up in a single stem and, and rubbed off some buds and occasionally take a, a cutting or two. Let's see, oh yeah, this is a really cute tree. This is BNR, Bordesau Negramata. Got the cutting from Harvey in 2020. And uh, this is on its own roots. And typically, this is one that's probably a better choice to graft because it's a slow grower. But I have never taken a cutting off of this. I have never basically done any anything to this other than feed it. Let's pull it out of here. We can, we can see it a little bit better. Borsot Negra Ramada for ponds. Beautiful shape. Look at that growth. Now, the reason we're getting this great growth is not because of sunlight alone. Sunlight contributes, but it's because of heat. And heat is what gets these trees grow going like this. Now, if you're growing in an unnatural environment like a greenhouse that off offers a ton of heat, you're going to get you're going to get fruit set. If I go over to these figs, even though we've had some really good heat, well, this is highly unusual. Let's see if I can get in there and focus on this. It's kind of difficult. Right here. Those are, the, those are double bumps. We never get double bumps <laughs> this early in the year. So that's highly unusual. And that's not because of light. These figs would be getting the same amount of light if it wasn't warm. That's because of heat with the light. So this whole thing of light is the reason you get figs. And it's being, uh, it's been said over and over on the internet. 
let me tell you, I'll give you a little story. I was uh, fig hunting with Doug in Northern California. And uh, it was a beautiful September day. We were going up the side of this mountain, basically. And it was 95 degrees around. And you could see the wild trees. And in nature, what these trees do is when they're spread by birds uh, with viable seed droppings, they have a tendency to uh, grow really well around any kind of drainage or moisture. And they grow together. So one tree will grow up into the other tree. So when you're looking at a fig, it's very difficult to tell which tree it actually comes from. And they form this dense canopy. And there are figs that are getting absolutely no sunlight or very little sunlight on the actual fig. And they're growing and ripening fine. Why? Because the tree is getting a lot of light and it's warm. So they ripen the figs. It's a simple thing. You need light. Of course you need light. That's growing 101. But with figs, you need light. And even more important than the light, you need the heat. This is a tree I really, this is probably my favorite tree. So I'm going to ask a question to you. If you had one tree that you were going to keep in a pot, what would it be? This would be mine right here. Calderona from Wilson in, in uh, 2019 bought as an air layer. Big, beautiful leaves. Okay, let's do another little walk around the yard. So these are two trees here that uh, really haven't done well on the deck because they can't handle the heat because they were just root, partially root pruned and up potted. Beltrana from Ponds and Mariah. They're both 2021 cuttings that I grew, but they're doing fine under this tree. This heat has pushed all the pawpaws to uh, set out some nice leaves. And this is basically, these get morning sun and that's all the sun they get. When they're young like this, if you can give them shade in the afternoon, that's a wonderful thing. This is the same situation with these jujubes. They just broke and they're doing fine. They're only getting a tiny bit of morning sun. Once again, a little bit of sun and a lot of heat. So heat is the key for a lot of trees. Hey, let's take a look at the project. So you remember the big piles of rock where I took the rock walls out. The rock is all gone. That monster tree that was in the corner is gone. And this is the setup where I'm building my fence. Building prices have gone up. So this is how I'm building the fence. So I explained the chamfer de detail on the top. And let's go to the top of a post and take a look at it. That's the detail I make on my radial arm saw. And it's a four by four. It's pressure treated eight foot, six feet above the ground, two feet in the ground with uh, two bags of sacrete concrete, 60 pounds is each. So 120 pounds of concrete at each post. This was the difficult one. I had to detach my section of the fence from the old post. <laughs> I had to detach the neighbor's section that going that way and the neighbor's section going that way. And uh, I had to get out a concrete ball that was 120 pounds out of that hole at the same time. So it all came out just fine. You can see where I connected my old fence into it, the neighbor's fence into it, and the new fence into it. So what I do is I, I cut a, one board. And this is a five and a half inch cedar. I try to get the clearest wood I can find. And then I put that in. And after I put that in, I'll go to the next post and uh, put another one in. Then I have a size where I can go through and I can clear a trench out, put my rock in. And what I'm doing here is kind of just building a temporary retaining wall. I guess it really isn't temporary, it's more permanent with the fence. 
right here, I'm just taking three of the old stringers from the old fence, that are two by fours, pressure treated, and I'm putting them in here. And the reason I'm putting them in here is my neighbor's irrigation is right there and a bunch of soil out and very, very steep grade is here. And now that can come down and that can come against these two by fours and it won't be setting on my cedar boards, rotting the boards. So uh, I use a series of two by four by eight stringers. I use three stringers for extra support. And you can see in the back how they're connected. That's pretty much how I build it. Now this is a new thing that I'm doing this year is I'm cleaning out the soil under the fence and I'm running in by the fence some inch and a half inch round river rock. And first I'm laying in a little bit of a quarter inch minus. Then I lay the, the river rock in. The quarter inch minus looks like this. And the river rock goes on top of it. And that will be nice when it rains. The rain will hit the uh, quarter, the uh, river rock and it won't splash mud up onto the fence because I've had a problem with that over here. I'm going to run it all the way down the fence. See how muddy and gross that looks? I'll wash that off and then I'm going to run some rock. So that's the project with the fence. Coming along, six days. These are the two uh, English laurel that I saved when I took the stump out. They've gone through some really hot weather. I'm going to go through now and I have a lot of leaves that look like this. They're really sunburned and I'll get my uh, pruning snips and I'll start taking some of these off. Hopefully save that this one looks pretty bad. <laughs> so we'll see if that makes it. So that's the fence project. Laurel is popping with all this heat. And uh, yeah, I just bring my boards up here, stage my boards. I create one angle cut for the angle on the top of the boards and it's the same for everything. So after I have my saw set up at that angle cut, I come across my uh, saw and I basically make one cut. Looks to me like that angle cut is about, uh, about three degrees. So that's all it is. And I'll make one tiny cut and that's the top of the board. Take it out and I'll put the boards on. So the boards are approximately five and a half inches wide. And when I get down towards the end, so <clears throat> instead of putting one board right here that's five and a half and another board that's here that's five and a half and having a tiny piece over here, I'll graduate it. So I'll take this board here and maybe this will be approximately four and a half and then maybe four and then maybe three so i'll it'll graduate down in size so you don't see big board big board little tiny piece i'll just rip it on my table saw and uh, that's the fence pretty pretty stout it's only been in a week Okay, those are the projects and yeah I'll double down on uh, what I'm saying about light versus heat light is important light isn't the important thing only important thing when you're growing figs heat I'm excited to see those double bumps that was a surprise and that we've never like I say never had this kind of weather this early in the year so it almost mimics what you'd see in a greenhouse to a certain extent, except the greenhouses that across the country, many of those have started way earlier and they have a lot more growth. This is an interesting tree here, Del San Wami Gran. It had, a, um, it had a sucker coming up right in here and it was coming up, oh gosh, it was probably 24, 28 inches tall. It was a single stem. So I, I um, when I bare rooted it, and you can go to my videos and see how I bare root, I bare rooted it and found, went down on the, the base of it and found where the sucker was attached, cut it off and took a small amount of roots with it. Um, and 
put that in a seven gallon and that's starting to break bud. So I've got two trees out of it, but it slowed this tree down, you know. Once again, all this shape done without any kind of staking to the side. This is just nature. It's just being aware. A lot of this is just being aware of what's going on, watching your trees. If you're new to single stem trees, I can understand how you might think that, oh, you gotta spread all the limbs apart, <laughs> you know, and it's just not the case. So don't worry if you're not spreading your limbs apart. That's what they make pruning snips for. That's what they make your fingers for, for rubbing buds off. Look at my Zephyro here. That was probably 18 inches where I pinched. It's growing this way. and I'm letting this one happen because that's you know, empty space. And look at the spacing. Pinching and um, using your pruning snips. Very simple. Don't have to overcomplicate this. But you do have to pay attention as you're growing. And you can see, I mean, if you're seeing the overall shape of my trees, you're understanding that maybe this staking really isn't necessary, right? It's a cute little tree. It's my first tree that I got. Oh, not, I take it back, not my first tree that I got. My first one was Desert King. That was in 17. This is in 18, 2018, from a gentleman. I'm not sure if he pronounces his name Vasile or Vasile, but uh, I think he was back in, back east, I think Pennsylvania, but I'm not sure. Um, and I got this Figo Preto from him and it kind of grew up in this crazy, crazy form. And uh, I actually really like it. I think it's almost like a bonsai, really beautiful shape. And the best fig I've ever eaten in my life came off of this little tree. And it's a slow grower, just like BNR. You get to see a few of my varieties here. Never staked. One of the slowest growing trees I've had. This is uh, from Kremp in 2020. Bass's favorite fig on its own roots. Probably a good candidate for grafting. But if you're patient, it, it grows out. That's pretty much it. Anyways, I want to just uh, tell you that uh, sometimes you get lucky, right? And that's what we got this year is really lucky with this heat. Who knows what the rest of the season holds? I mean, it could be great. It could be so-so. But heat. Heat, heat, heat. Sunlight is a part of heat. Right, because sunlight can give you the greenhouse effect. Sunlight is warmth on the leaves. That is heat. But you get the great growth and you get the double bumps setting earlier with heat. And if you have a greenhouse, you have a huge head start over the majority of people growing these figs without a greenhouse. Okay, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Please take the time to subscribe and give a thumbs up.